Hello and welcome. I'm Anne-Marie Christian, an independent safeguarding consultant. I'm delighted to be hosting a discussion on software used for safeguarding in schools for the State of Data 2020 event for Defend Digital Me. First, I'm very pleased to welcome our three panellists. Hi, I'm Georg L. I'm the CEO at Smoothball. I'm Leo Ratledge. I'm the Legal and Policy Director at the Child Rights International Network. I'm Ailey Callender. I'm a lawyer and programme lead at Privacy International. Welcome all, and thank you for joining us. I'll start with some context. Filtering and monitoring software in UK schools are commonly used across the primary and secondary state school sector in England. The Keeping Children Safe in Education guidance from the DfE means schools are expected to watch out for children who are looking at content that is illegal. Likewise, terrorism, you know, information or issues around self-harm. Schools are worried about being the next school, like the case of girls who were sent to Syria and questions over whether they were groomed online. But some parents are worried what these keywords are or the implications if the system suggests their child is a potential gang member or risk of suicide. And when it comes to prevent duty, that school have had since 2015, there's questions of how far a school's obligations reach beyond the school gate and into family life. I'm really excited to have these experts with me today to tackle some of these topics. So let's start with some background, Georg. What are the broad principles behind the filtering and monitoring software in UK schools used by staff, such as a designated safeguarding lead? Broadly speaking, safeguarding in schools and the use of software to do that is about upholding the principles of um, uh, keeping children safe in education legislation is a good way to think about it. So protecting children from maltreatment, prote preventing impairment of health, making sure children grow up in circumstances with a provision of safe and effective care and taking action to enable all children have the best outcomes. And we at Smooth, we focus on the digital aspect of that safeguarding. So essentially all of those things, but in the digital world. Um, and we, do, we have a number of different um, products and services, but principally we think about filtering and monitoring. And so filtering is about preventing children being exposed to harmful content, pornography, violence, and so on and monitoring is about the um, detection of children that are potentially at risk based on some of their online behaviours and then alerting the school's designated safeguarding leadership to that potential risk. The idea is to use technology as one component of a whole school approach around safeguarding so that there's you know, every member of staff is involved, there's a common language, and the technology is just one element of that. Um, but obviously, at the, the, um, in the ultimate uh, event of a decision on how to engage with a child, the school head or the DSL is still ultimately responsible for how that is executed. So we're just a, we're just a tool in that sense. Um, UK schools have been using filtering at least for at least as long as the internet has been around, so 20 years or so. Um, I think the very early filters blocked almost everything uh, and there was a lot of overblocking concern and then it's become more sophisticated over time. With what we found is that particularly with the rise of um, so-called web 2.0 social media, user-generated content, um, the, the range of risks and the speed with which those develop has increased. So there's a, there's a greater focus now on real-time and content-aware filtering. Monitoring, um, I'd have to estimate, but probably somewhere around 20, 30% of schools are doing something in the realm of digital monitoring. Okay. I that helps. What's the basic way it works? The basic tenant is to bring to the attention of a DSL a child that may be at risk of um, harm or, or potentially of causing harm um, by what they're typing online, their, their online behaviour. So the, the technology is installed onto a school managed device. So it doesn't, for example, work on a home device or bring your own device. And um, there's, there's this application on the device that is looking out for the, the trigger, triggering words and behaviours. And then that, uh, if, the, if it's triggered, it creates a silent screenshot. That's um, uh, assessed by an AI algorithm that is looking for uh, these signs that we've uh, tuned the algorithm to look for. It's important to say we've done this with an education 
point of view in mind. There are other services that work a little bit like this in sort of public social media world. Those don't work very well in the world of education, so we've really tuned it. Uh, and then from the AI, it goes to a team of uh, human moderators that review what the computer, the grading that the computer has applied, uh, tweak that grading if necessary, and then uh, forward that onto the school. So the school will receive a sort of database that has the lower graded incidents in there. The DSL can always review those. And for a higher graded incident, for example, an imminent threat of um, to life through, through, through suicide, uh, they'll get a phone call 24 hours a day so they can react very much in, in real time. So we're talking response times of minutes um, for the very serious incidents. And, um, and also that human moderation allows us to weed out the false positives. So we try and um, save a bit of time for DSLs who are otherwise you know, at risk of being swamped with um, uh, information. And then, you know, as, as anyone would when swamped with information, you either worry about what you might miss or you start to, you know, miss the wood for the tree, so to speak. So trying to save time, really focus the the um, uh, the identification of these issues and um, make sure that uh, the DSL can then react in, in the moment as appropriate. Thank you. And I appreciate you mentioned the Keeping Children Safe in Education statutory guidance. Ailey, seen through a legal lens, what's the general principle of communication law that apply here to monitoring internet activity? Thanks. So, I mean, there are a range of, of legal frameworks that apply um, to the monitoring of internet activity. And I mean, in this situation, we're talking about um, a range from kind of international human rights law, where you have the Convention on the Rights of the Child to, um, to domestic law. So you have the Human Rights Act, which um, enshrines the European Convention on Human Rights, which includes rights like the right to privacy, but also other rights such as the right to freedom of expression. And there, um, the core of that framework is that any measures um, interfere with these rights must uh, meet the requirements of legality, necessity, and proportionality. So there must be a clear law, and that law must be uh, seeking to achieve a legitimate aim, and it must be proportionate. Um, and so I think these are some of the, the questions uh, that, that this work raises in terms of actually is the law clear um, is the aim clear um, and also in terms of the proportionality of, of the use of, of digital safeguarding. Um, but there are other frameworks too. So um, if you're talking about concerns around discrimination, you have laws like the Equality Act, but then particularly when we're talking about the use of data and the use of devices, and um, the key legal framework would be data protection laws. So in the UK, that is the UK Data Protection Act together with the general data protection regulation known as GDPR. And you also have a, another law, which is about confidentiality of communications and access to devices. Um, and in the UK, that's the Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulations. So there's a range of different legal frameworks. And in particular, there are some kind of human rights and data protection issues that we'll probably get into later on. And is there different law when it comes to social media chats and webcams? So, I mean, social media um, and, and webcams and all, all, of, all of these online activities are, are generating data about us um, and they're also about how we communicate in our lives. So these activities are, are also covered by, by human rights law um, and, and by data protection law as well. Leo, you work in the area of child rights. The principles of these products are framed around safeguarding and child protection. Are there other rights that matter in law that should be considered here? In terms of children's human rights, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is the key legal tool internationally. Uh, every country in the world has signed up with the exception of the United States, and it covers the full scope of children's human rights. Specifically in the context of safeguarding, uh, there are a number of important provisions, uh, specifically protection-oriented rights. There is the uh, right to protection from all forms of violence, which requires states to take appropriate measures to prevent children um, being victims of violence. Um, that includes legislation, uh, social and educational measures as well. And it's bolstered by a separate protection against uh, sexual violence and exploitation. 
but it's important to see these rights not in a vacuum but as, as part of the convention as a whole so they're also the um, rights to privacy for example the right to freedom of expression uh, the right to access information and right of thought conscience and religion as well as these specific rights there is some broad general principles that cut across um, the full convention so there is the prohibition on discrimination which is important in a number of settings when we're talking about um, monitoring software um, so if we're looking at measures that might impact disproportionately children from certain groups whether on the basis of sexuality uh, religion ethnicity um, it would be very important to look at discriminatory or potentially discriminatory impacts and the convention also has a concept called the evolving capacities of the child, which is a recognition that uh, while younger children in particular will need more support in exercising their rights, as they grow up, that needs to give way to greater autonomy um, and, and um, taking their rights in their own hands. I think there is possibly a tendency in this area to talk about these protection rights as in conflict or intention with um, the more participatory rights. But I think this is, generally speaking, a mistake. And the better reading is to see them as mutually supportive. Um, so, for example, if we're looking at protection measures that are overly intrusive, um, they're both an interference with the right to privacy, but they also undermine the safeguarding goals in that they cause children to hide their behavior rather than, um, than it being apparent. So I think um, it's really important to, to look at the way these rights all interact together uh, and see them as a cohesive whole. Okay. Georg, what concerns some people is that children's online activity could be monitored by someone outside of their school. If all the content on screens can be captured from their screens, could it not include sensitive data like login details and passwords? When is it a person versus a computer system that decides if there is something worth flagging? I guess the order in which things would happen is that the child would do something on the um, device, which the computer decides triggers um, some kind of review that is then reviewed by the artificial intelligence, reviewed by our human moderators, at which point it's graded and sent to the DSL, okay. the nominated designated safeguarding lead in the school. The DSL will take that information. They can, um, they then, they then own it. They control it. They um, decide if they agree or not with the pre-grading that has been given. They can change that. They can choose to um, delete it. They can attach it to a safeguarding record of a child if they think that is the right thing to do. Um, and so it's really over to them at that point uh, how they want to use the tool and what the appropriate action is given the full contextual understanding that they have about that child. But in terms of um, specifically the point around sensitive data, login details and passwords, et cetera, a couple of points. One is, um, as a company, we've actually taken a specific um, stance on webcam that we will not access the webcam for photo or video. There are other vendors that do similar things to Smoothwall that do access the webcam, um, and that's under the IT person's control. My concern with that is that the potential for capturing an image that would be inappropriate is very high, particularly when thinking about the subject matter that might be filtered. Um, we could start with pornography and then go from there. But um, so basically the risks of using webcam uh, and the ethics of that, I think, just are not right. And so we don't do that. But in terms of um, login details, passwords, uh, or for older children, sort of debit card details and that kind of thing, we have um, sophisticated mechanisms in the software that de detect when those are being used and then don't capture those. Um, uh, it works very well. No system is completely infallible. Obviously, we're always trying to improve it. The moderators themselves that we use um, work for us. They're based in the UK, heavily restricted workstations that prevent them from taking screenshots of their own, exporting data using USB sticks, et cetera. And there's a significant amount of training and managerial oversight there as well to make sure that um, uh, you know they continue to behave um, with uh, you know all the right intentions and according to policy. Are there any particular concerns where artificial intelligence is used 
I think whenever we're talking about the use of artificial intelligence, it opens a whole host of, of questions. And I mean, here we're, if we're talking about the use of artificial intelligence in this context. One of the questions is, is how, how is how is this AI trained and, and what is the application um, specifically? And, and there is there is one of the questions that's raised, for example, is how how are children how is children's data and the data gathered through the use of, of different softwares in different contexts used to train these um, applications? How are questions such as uh, risk of bias, of discrimination, for example, uh, how are they built in and assessed and and how it, how are they limited um, when AI is used in this context? And you know, we know that in, in many cases it, it's not just um, the use of artificial intelligence, but then later down the line, um, humans are brought in. But it's still there's still a range of questions that remain answered, and I think perhaps we'll cover them later in terms of the the data protection and, and human rights implications and and questions around what. The, um, what those keywords are, why those are the keywords, and, and what, what's on what list, for example. All these uh, requirements when it comes to transparency, fairness, accuracy, how do they play out in this context? And um, people have, people, including children, have rights in relation to their data. So, you know, you have a right to access your data, but you also have the right to delete your data. So how does that play out in, in this context? And there are specific provisions when it comes to automated decisions that might have uh, impacts on your life. And, and these kind of clearly seem to fall within that context. So there's questions there. But also when we talk about monitoring software that's always on, how does that um, sit alongside, for example, uh, schools obligation when it comes to data protection by design and by default and obviously again it's it comes back to that question of proportionate proportionality and, and balancing risks um, and looking at whole spectrum of of rights and I think also one thing to flag is um it, it sometimes seems that uh, because a, a software won't necessarily have the name of an individual um, and it'll be a user ID they might not necessarily consider actually you know this is someone's personal data but it's very intimate data it's like a huge you're building a profile on someone so these uh legal frameworks definitely come into into play and it it seems very clear from the work that has been done that that these questions remain thank you there's lots to think about there especially on profiling and are these kinds of products activated when school children log in at home it might be especially important to understand how now in lockdown. So um, this, so if we differentiate between filtering and monitoring, I guess a little bit, um, in both cases, they tend to work best on a school managed device. So the more modern um, filtering uh, technologies, uh, including our own, uh, require a small agent to be installed on the device that has the benefit that that school provided device will then have the school agreed filtering policies wherever that device is in the world. So if the school are providing a, a Chromebook or a Windows device to a child, um, then they often want to know that their carefully curated policies, which are often age group appropriate and have a high degree of granularity, um, will be applied, particularly since they feel a sense of responsibility having provided that device to make sure that that device isn't then subsequently opened up to the internet at large. And so um, uh, what well, the same thing is true on a monitoring side, on the monitoring side where an agent is also required to be installed on the device. And again, that works better when the school is managing that device because they can push those agents out and then make sure that they stay there. So typically, um, uh, these types of services don't work well on a bring your own device basis or on a home um, PC basis. But it could be an exception to that if a home PC or home device is being used to log in uh, via a VPN connection, for example, into the school's network. And if that school is then using smooth monitoring or another monitoring service inside of its network, then, of course, because the device is now accessing that network before going out to the wider Internet, then it will still have the benefit of that filtering. But um, as soon as that connection breaks, then that device is still going out to the open internet unfiltered um, in its own right. So, so really both filtering and monitoring work best on um, best or sometimes at all 
on school provided managed devices. And, and actually the second part of the question in terms of that varying across products, it, it doesn't really. So it works in much the same way across different products. So if a school provides a laptop to a child who brings that computer home, will the software only work if the child accesses the school platform? Or we'd also be monitoring if they're doing anything else on that computer. If they are using the school managed device, then the, that device will be filtered for all of its outbound internet access. Um, and also if the school has put the monitoring software on there, then anything that happens on that will be monitored. Um, so a good example would be, we've seen cases where children write, um, write themselves a little diary Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes delete it afterwards. In fact, there was a heartbreaking case of a I think six or seven year old girl who went to a public website called um, Toot Toot, which is a, a, a sort of disclosure site. So, mm -hmm. um, and she wrote into that website the story of the abuse that she was suffering at home and then thought better of submitting it, deleted the content. And so no one would ever have known except our monitoring software happened to be installed on that particular okay. device. Okay. Okay, that's an example of, of someone who's deleted what they're saying and then it was still picked up as a concern. So implicit in that, I guess, is what happens if people are typing things which then aren't registered as concerns. That all gets deleted, just to okay. sort of okay. answer the question. So once the child's logged on, if an older sibling was to use the internet and trigger something which is on the topic of the watch list, like pornography or violence, there's no way of knowing if it is the people or someone else in the household. Yeah, that's a fair point. This, this actually is one of the reasons that some companies give for triggering the webcam, because okay. they, then, they then say, well, we'll take a snapshot. So yeah. when that person's looking at something, or whatever, we want to know who it is. Well, oh. imagine the consequences. So. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Ailey, what are your overall reflections on some of the issues with monitoring raised in the Defend Digital Me report? So, um, in a sense, I mean, monitoring, uh, as we're talking about it, even in this context, is is a form of, of surveillance and can be highly invasive. Um, in the sense of this is this can be you know twenty four seven and it can follow follow children home and and capture such a, a range of data, whether it's passwords, even if there are then um, mechanisms for, for filtering that out later on, but also um, data that, that someone has has deleted, as as we know. And then some uh, softwares also may take a screenshot of you as you're using your device. Um, and often um, the software that's there for, for this monitoring is, is hidden, so it won't be uh, clear to, to someone using a device that this software is there necessarily and often it will be on by default and someone would have to take action to, to turn it off. Um, and so yeah, all these questions in terms of legality, necessity and por proportionality come to the fore. And I think one of the things that struck me in the report was, for example, um, DFE uh, guidance uh, flagging that schools really need to consider the proportionality of the risk, but the risk versus the cost without really flagging. Actually, you also need to be uh, looking at the proportionality of the risk um, versus the, the different in intrusions on, on children's on children's rights um, and the rights of, of anyone else using devices. And it, it can also be, I think, some um, applications used to monitor staff as well. Um, so there's a lot of uh, questions from a human rights perspective and a data protection perspective. And the answers to these seem to, to vary slightly depending on the different applications used. Um, and you know how is how is the data used and uh, monitoring um, and the different monitoring programs are in a sense profiling programs and and profiling is something that is regulated by data protection law and um, this is something that. PI we've looked into a lot, for example, with data brokers and um, with the whole advertising online advertising ecosystem, but there's you know real questions in terms of of the decisions that are made and. As a consequence of that profiling, but how these categories are formed and how you might fall within one category or another, um, and you know, I think particularly when we think about the types of categories that might be used in monitoring software, they can range from something like oversharer to 
a potential pedophile or terrorist and you know having these labels associated with you um you know what are the consequences of of that for you um now and then and then going in forward in the future and so there's still many questions in terms of of those profiling practices you know who this data is shared with, for what purposes, and um, what the consequences are of that, the retention of, of this data, and um, you know, how long that's kept, um, and then also the legal basis, because the law um, isn't crystal clear. So you're saying there in summary, it matters that the young people and their families are made aware this happens, where their information goes and how it's used. Georg, you'd like to respond? Uh, well, the, the short answer is it should be, and it's and it's the school's responsibility, like it is with all of the software, to explain the usage policy and explain what's being rolled out. I work with lots of schools, and I wonder about these keywords and profiling and how they are associated with certain children, especially where there's concerns on child criminal exploitation or extremism, grooming online, and, and so on. Some of the key words that could be building up profiles for a child in these systems are around gangs or antisocial behaviours and will be using, for example, urban language. Whether it's London or Manchester, if I'm thinking about urban culture and children, some of that profiling depends on language and keywords in language they're using. Who works out those keywords are for that school? Or is it the company that decides it across the country generally? Um, so I, th I think there's a, a, a few points I'd like to just come back to in some of the things that have been said, but the, in terms of that particular question, um, part of it is a body of knowledge built up over 16, 17 years. So Smoothwall has been doing filtering for a very long time. We have a dedicated team of people who are um, uh, focused, their full-time job is looking across the internet, looking at the different memes, looking at language, looking at categories of content um, and fine-tuning the filtering engine specifically so that we don't overblock. That's been one of the you know concerns around education as well and I think it's, it's somewhat addressed as one of Dio's points around for example sexual education and making sure that you know access is allowed and similarly interestingly there one of the concerns people sometimes have is um, that if a student is doing some research on I don't know let's say drugs for example um, well, everything should be blocked. Well, actually, our experience, this is where the real world sometimes meets the, the I, I think Leo put it nicely earlier, I forget the exact form of words, but how it's, it's how, how good things sound in a neutral tone of voice. You know, sometimes the real world clashes with that. So you don't block everything to do with drugs, because actually, if a child is doing a bit of research into drugs, you know, they might do a couple of steps of research, but one of those steps may also take them to a helpline, may help them to, you know, if, if they're researching what does it feel like to die by suicide in a particular manner? That may be because they're actually trying to figure out a path towards help. So if you just if you just put block, 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 you know, then um, actually you you cause I think more harm than good. It's if it's good on paper, it's bad in practice. Um, so so part of the answer to your question, Emery, is that we've got a group of people who do this full time, but we also take a lot of outside input. So from our tens of thousands of customers, from um, independent bodies, police forces that we work with, um, just kind of help wherever we can get it, uh, you know, um, IWF and all, all different sources for different kinds of, of you know, to, to tune the rule based system. And um, I do, I do very much take the point that I think knowledge uh, is important and we you know, sort of encourage schools to um, let students know. If you look at the case study of Northern Education Trust, one of the reasons they won is that actually the, the name of our software is known to all students and all staff. So it's, it's, it's that visible inside the trust that there is some software out there. Um, and uh, it's kind of, um, I think consent is a little bit more challenging and if one of the things you're looking for is the potential for um, someone being wrapped up in county lines, you, you can't ask them for consent because the answer will be no. Um, and then you, you know, you're sort of blind to that particular concern. Um, so I think there are uh, some interesting uh, moments where actually the necessity and proportionality um, override consent in specific kind of cases around monitoring and, and in schools particularly. Um, and, and I kind of, I kind of think there's there's also um, 
an issue around driving children underground that again was referenced i think by leo um, which is an absolutely true point all our research says the same only five percent of children will actually go to a teacher to talk about an issue so you have to be really careful about you know it, how you how you drive um the research and the communication you know to places where you can't find it you can't see it you can't do anything to help and that, that's that can be risky what would you like to add Hayley? Um, I was just going to highlight that, I mean, privacy is an enabling right. So it's a right that enables lots of other rights. So whether that's um, the right to seek information, the right to express yourself, the right to freedom of thought, all these rights um, that that gives you. And, um, you know, when we're talking about surveillance and, and monitoring in our everyday life, you know, this is because this has become so normalized and um, it, it, particularly through the online advertising ecosystem, which introduces a vast amount of tracking into our daily interactions. Um, this is a, a version of that in schools for, for a very specific purpose, but you know, it does raise a huge number of questions in terms of the normalization of this level of monitoring and surveillance and the impact that has you know, the chilling effect on, on how, how young people behave and, and the kind of consequences for that so it's I think going back to that the beginning and, and asking that question you know actually what is it that we're trying to do here and is this actually the way to go about that okay thank you yeah I could I could respond a bit to that I think um that um you, you're absolutely right and I agree you've got to be very specific about the application of these types of um technologies and services and uh you know as it happens, my own belief, this is looking, casting forward, if I may, the five years into the future, 10 years into the future, is that the general zeitgeist of society is leaning towards um, uh, a greater expectation that companies will take proactive steps to protect the mental health of their employees. And so I think in five years' time, if there's a suicide in the ranks at Amazon or Tesco or Barclays or wherever it might be a big employer, the NHS, the Army, you know, I think that the HRD is going to be asked questions as to what he or she could and should have um, done to, to see that coming. Uh, we're not there yet as society. I think that's that's different. That's in the future. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but I think in terms of children, we we look at the um, self-harm rate, we look at the bullying rates, we look at the suicide rates, and we look at the risks posed by um a, a range of online harms and I think their society has taken a specific view that that's what we're trying to do and we're trying to address those those trends and um, and that's where the necessity and the proportionality kicks in uh, yeah and I, I think it's uh, related to that um one kind of word of caution here I think has to be you know is this techno solution and techno solutionism in the sense of you know what are the causes of of those problems and is that going to the heart of it or is it just adding another another layer in so i think there there are, are still questions there yeah you you you're, no, you i wholeheartedly agree um this is not this is not going to the root of those problems um you know this doesn't solve bullying at its root or anxiety um, you know, an interesting phenomenon that I understand completely now amongst young people is actually um, uh, climate change anxiety. You know, and, and all we can do is see the signs of that and help um, uh, early intervention take place appropriately. But we're not going to the root of any of it. Uh, you know, well, certainly we're not going to the root of many of these issues. In June 2019, the DfE added more guidance around teaching children about online safety and digital literacy. Schools are certainly starting to educate children more about where their information goes online and how other track them online. I wonder if digital literacy training is what's missing here. I think it's over education is the answer. Sorry, Leo, to cut across you, I'll, I'll shut up in a moment, but if we can educate young children about how it works and also do mental resilience training and just understand the signs, often children don't know that they are being groomed. And that's, you know, that's another reason why relying on them to come forward is challenging at times. But anyway, Leo, let me. I was just going to say that I think the digital literacy point is an interesting one, um, but it also applies to the use of 
monitoring software for safeguarding. Um, a lot of children don't understand how it works, and the figures produced in the Defend Digital Me report that we're talking about mm -hmm. show actually an alarming number of parents don't even know whether the measures are being applied. So mm -hmm. this is a, a multiple failure of digital literacy. I think that uh, it's a sad reality that with all of the amazing opportunity that the internet does provide, that there are risks and pitfalls along the way, and that um, therefore, and it's and it, and it, and therefore we need to have some protections. And it is something of an arms race, you know. What and one can't um, ignore the predatory nature of some actors online and, and some of the risks that are out there. So the question is, how do we proportionately uh, protect children uh, in in that, given the necessity of doing so? and do that in a way that uh, marries data privacy and protection so that they are um, you know, really tightly engaged. I think any, any provider of services in this space needs to be extremely thoughtful about data privacy and recognize that there are tensions at times between those two things and that balance has to be maintained with the with the you know with the child and and good reasonable intelligent people can find themselves slightly you know either slightly further apart on that spectrum of those two things but as long as it's not uh, unbalanced then i think we will societally find a good way forward um, to, uh, to 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 put these technologies in place to protect children as one tool in a whole in a spectrum of education and other things thank you can you make recommendations to monitoring when it comes to the rights of the child, Leo? I think the recommendations that I would make would largely be around setting some really good boundaries for the use of this kind of software. Um, I mean, first and foremost, that children shouldn't be being monitored in ways that they aren't aware of. It's a, a, quite a, a simplistic um, principle, I accept, but I think it's a very important one. Um, and if, if you're trying to influence the way that they behave online through the monitoring, software then I don't see what's to be gained by them not knowing and understanding how it works. Children shouldn't be subject to technological monitoring without their knowledge ever and where they have capacity um, they should be able to, to give their free and informed consent and that means being able to say no as well uh, which is from a lot of the research out there not something that's being realized. Um, I think that also there is some types of content that uh, certainly shouldn't be falling within the remit of monitoring software. I'm thinking that the, I mean, the perfect example of this is, is counselling. Uh, any kind of confidential service uh, is, is entirely undermined by uh, monitoring software. And it's, it's important for children as much as anyone else to have these kind of confidential therapeutic settings um, where they can talk in complete confidence. I think when we're talking about blocking and filtering software, the concerns are less, but they're not non-existent. I think we need to be very careful about ensuring that the types of content that children need to access, particularly uh, certain minority groups of children, uh, are not uh, denied them, um, particularly around in the early days of, of filtering software. Information about sexual health, particularly for um, LGBT children, was, was commonly filtered out. And, and that's obviously become problematic, even in a school setting, because lots of children don't live in families where they can have these open conversations or where it's safe for them to, to look this up for information up at home. So a word of caution on that as well. And I suppose my final point would be a plea for transparency. Uh, I think it's something that a lot of organisations who work on this area really struggle with because it's very difficult to see how um, how the software is being used in schools. I mean, we've certainly tried to find out through freedom of information requests about how schools are implementing policies and we're finding that they are refusing to give that information because it involves private company services and obviously private companies don't fall within the Freedom of Information Act. Um, a lot of a lot of what you said, Ailey, really chimed with me in terms of trying to find the legal basis by which information is being collected and processed. And I think unless we have access to this kind of information, it's really difficult to assess whether schools are meeting their obligations to children. Um, so a plea for transparency is how I'd end.
I think uh, the report highlights that there is a long way to go in terms of ensuring that monitoring software is being used in a way that does comply mm -hmm. with human rights and, and data protection law and that a starting place to ensure that happens uh, is that plea for transparency that Leo made and then kind of taking going forward from there making sure that we are asking the questions before rolling out technology to, to solve some of these issues. Thank you very much for your contribution today. It's been a really interesting conversation. Thank you. I know Jen wants this to be the start of a conversation across the sector and one that much better involves young people and their families. Perhaps we might be able to invite you to carry that on again another time in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>